welcome. I will be talking about invertible programs. My name is Sergei Shabano. Uh, I came from Montreal, Canada. I'm a happy developer. There. I work in real functional job in Scala. And what makes me even more happy is the fact that I can contribute to uh, open source, also in Scala. So today I'll be talking about the library I built. Um, it's a library that allows you to create programs that you can run both ways. So if you if you look for invertible, something like invertible parsers with the word invertible, you will come up um, on this paper. This paper is kind of old. It's uh, about 10 years old. And it describes a theoretical way of how to combine two different programs, namely for parsing and printing, into one implementation. Um, but it's Haskell, and <laughs> we are in the Scala conference. <laughs> Ten years ago, I didn't even know that Haskell or Scala languages even existed. Um, in 2015, most press could build uh, this library, which is uh, a direct translation of the example Haskell pro program uh, that accompanied the original research. And for me, it was supposed to be too late. Luckily enough, um, I didn't know about that library existed in 2015. <laughs> Um, by the time I was interested in, in this field, I worked uh, in a company that we built a little DSL back then. <coughs> uh, and so I didn't really have enough knowledge to understand how to run programs both ways. So DSL, we needed a, a parser, a compiler. Uh, <coughs> in 2018, John DeGos made his famous uh, tweet where he said, um, I will guide you through functional programming and will teach you in exchange for you doing some contributions in open source. Uh, a bunch of folks joined. Uh, I was one of those. And the deal was you can take any project you'd like and work on it. And um, I ended up in parsers. So in <laughs> six months ago, we released the first version which we introduced in uh, LambdaConf. Uh, but I got a lot of feedback, and the best feedback I got was, why the hell it's so complicated? <laughs> um, if I would ask this question, if I would answer this question now, I would say that it was so complicated because it was based on the original research done for Haskell Symposium, heavily inspired by Haskell code translated to Scala, and also based on Scala Z8, which isn't even released. <laughs> Um, so, John also gave me good feedback how that can be improved and simplified in terms of API. And I did it. So, six months later, we have a new version that looks completely different. But before I'll show you how it looks like, I <coughs> just want you to see, uh, to intuitively understand what is invertibility. So, actually, it's quite intuitive by the word itself. English word inver invertible means you can go there and back. So, if you have two implementations or programs that can go between A's and B's. And if you manage to combine them into a single implementation, so one source code, not two different programs anymore, one source code, then that uh, program would be simply invertible. It would have two features that you can call with, I don't know, APIs, for example. And you can, uh, you can use a single implementation to go between these two values. That's a very intuitive way of thinking of it. Uh, however, mathematicians, they found this uh, simplicity long ago. And they named it with the fancy word isomorphism. Um, so I graduated from uh, Mars, but I studied different branches of mathematics. Uh, the category theory wasn't one of those. And I'm not very well versed in uh, category theory these days. So if you guys happen to have some rotten vegetables out there, please don't throw them at me for what I'm going to say next. <laughs> right? um, so what uh, category theory says is that um, in category theory, arrows are called morphisms, and items are just items, this A and B. So what it says is A and B would be isomorphic if you have two morphisms or arrows going between A and B. But that's not all. Mathematicians are very precise people. They say that. In order for that to happen, 
domain and codomain, which is like input of arrows, uh, must match. So it means that A on the input of one arrow should be exactly the same A in the output of other arrow. Well, why would we care? Well, we care because people who build programming languages uh, that have uh, based on, on uh, category theory as a theory, they do put these uh, restrictions in the language design. And in languages, uh, arrows become uh, functions and items become types. So what it practically means is that if we build these two functions right there, that the types should match fully. So anything I get from A into a function, I should run another function and the same A should go out. Uh, and here I have to make a disclaimer because what I'm talking about is real functions. So real functions are well-behaved citizens. They don't throw any exceptions, they take all input and always return the same value for the same output. So those three properties you might heard of. But very practically, they, they really behave in. Now if we not abide ourselves to those principles, None of the theory would make sense, and we will all descend into chaos. Uh, yeah. <coughs> now, what does paper say? Paper says, okay, you see, if you have real values, like five in quotes, you can get five. But how would you get from some text to a number? It's simply impossible. There is no number that would represent arbitrary text. And if you go on the other side, and we'll check this five, how would we get two plus three? Why not four plus one? So it should be the same output for the same input every time. And what they did, they said, okay, you know, isomorphism is practically too strict. Let's do something else. And they invented this. And <laughs> it's called partial isomorphism. I personally don't know how many mathematical series are broken here, but <laughs> what I found out that practically it works. On the very practical side, uh, the optional here is what, how they kept the purity in place. Now you can express, not this one, um, now you can express uh, going from some text into a number because you're not getting any number, you simply get an empty option, which is a valid result. Function accepts an input, produces an output, it abides all the types, everything is great. You can go from this not a number thing which oddly enough in GVM is a number, I think it's type double. But you can go from that and back to text and get something like an empty option of text. Totally possible. And this is how paper represents the part in a parser and printing problem solved into one coherent implementation. It's the same implementation, same types. It's just two different functions. But that's not all because this principle can be um, applied to different problems. For example, if you have a function that parses some bytes from network and produces an HTTP request, if you have another function that does check requests and produces bytes, you get this invertible implementation, but it's two different applications here right away. One is an implementation of a server, another an implementation of client, and you just build the code once. You don't build two different things here. So it's a coherent thing. You don't need to manually somehow make them aligned. Only one code base. So if you generalize just a little bit, you may think that our functions are somewhat effectful. So this f um, is simply an effect. And optionality is an effect after all. So if you just produce a function that may do some effect, and you have two of those functions coherently mapped uh, together, combined together into a single implementation, that's what the invertibility is. And this little program is invertible. So welcome to parsers. That's the zero dependency parsers combinators library for Scala. And what it allows you to do is that it allows you to combine invertible programs as building blocks into something bigger. You know, every functional program, they essentially give you ability to combine things. And so what this library combine are invertible programs themselves. So on this picture, you may probably see that 
you can go from A to E via some paths. And this is all compile time checked. Um, so I'm going to show you how it's how you can do that on any possible types you'd like. On this simple example, <coughs> the example would be um, take some program text, which is typed string, and produce um, a representation of that program where you can see how the program can be uh, um, executed. And it's done via this, oops, oops sorry, jumped. And it's, jumped it's done by uh, a very simple uh, algebraic data type, so a case class. If you may, um, <coughs> one represents a value, which you probably already know about, and another represents a function that has to be called. So a function has a name and a list of arguments. Only two different little case classes. You may think of, okay, that is probably some true example. Yes, it is, if you apply it to this program, that's a program for programmable calculator. When I was a kid, I probably didn't have any other computers to play with. So that was great. But this is really joy. Now, in the real world, you don't have, you don't need to work with it. It's kind of not interesting, not gonna pay. What you have in real world is something like this. This is the real uh, world application of a rule engine. And what that simple program says, it's you take some values, one from, let's say, your input, another from a database, and you can comp compare them by applying rules A and B. So that's what you do in uh, enterprise-grade rule engines. As a user, you write those programs. Now, this enterprise-grade things are uh, probably enterprise-level complex. Now I have a little library, and I want to prove it that you can do the same with 50 lines of code. Uh, and this is the program in some imaginary uh, um, language. But let's say Scala is also the same level of language. In Scala, you can do exactly this code and compile it. And it will work. And you can also represent this program with just these two little uh, case classes. Uh, I was supposed to give you that link, but we don't have a channel. Sorry. Uh, why do you need invertibility here, you may ask? Like, well, what's, uh, what's the application of invertible? So think of this example in, in a way. So you have a tool that allows you to build some programs, let's say express business rules. You can create, uh, you can take a source code, create a representation of this program, but then what happens when you need to migrate it? You need you release a new version, your customer asks for a new feature, you need to do an upgrade, some developer made a bug, and there is a lot of data on there, and its data is just programs. So what you can do, you can simply migrate them, like you do migration of databases. You take your source codes, compile them, migrate resulting structures, and generate source code back. It is also known as, um, how you call it, it's a automatic source migration tool. Let's say Scala has these tools. And when you go from versions like Scala 2 to Dotty, they in, uh, implement uh, migration tools. And they do pretty much similar techniques. So this, is, this slide represents w about one year of work. What I'm able to do is create one line. Uh, <laughs> that's the public interface of a library. And I couldn't do better because this is the only line, like the one is the only possible smallest com number of lines to create. You cannot create less than one probably. Nobody would believe you that you worked. Um, so this is the public interface of a library. You have this uh, data class that we call grammar, and this data class is what users work with. So before I tell you what that is, I'll just show you what types are because when you create one line of code, the complexity goes into types. Um, <coughs> okay, so it's a parser. So you have input type and output type, obviously. You also have that error channel here. Uh, you know, it's effectful, so you, you may not succeed in getting from some text to five. So in this case, you simply say, well, uh, I cannot. 
you don't fail it's just a it's just a value you produce and these two are state parameters it turned out that um, when you run your parsers or your programs threading state through an execution of a program it is so profoundly useful that i simply put it as a first class citizen in, in the library so that's why it's here now um, how can I describe what grammar is? So as a user, you work with these values, grammars, but what they are. <coughs> um, there is one important distinction between a function and a something that is specialized, like a parser function. So as a user, you would define which types this A and B is, let's say a string and a case class. But you also need to provide um, a mapping function, because otherwise how program can possibly know what you want to do? It, it cannot. So as a user, you simply provide these functions. And functions in this case could be like map a uh, state and the value into your output state and the value, or take an input and take a piece of it, and then return the rest and the value. And the parser, or in this case printer, it's the complete uh, feature that you can execute. So it's a function, of course. But parser goes from a state and input and can produce you either a value or an error and the rest of input and printer checks uh, yeah in the state if you use it and printer just simply goes in reverse now grammar is the data type as i mentioned it's very important it doesn't run anything it simply captures your input so when you grammar is your building block you create these functions you know what they do it's your business logic and you simply create these business lo business uh, building blocks, and grammar just captures them. And then, parser module is what builds the executable things, the programs that you can run, and it contains interpreters of that grammar. So, in um, like high level theory, it's called the free encoding. Uh, but I can show you how it's done on a very simple example. If you have this string one two, and you need to get list of uh, digits and the way to do it would be um, take a character from a string and give two functions that take a character from a string and between you a character and the rest of a string and the one that goes back and it's a value of grammar it's just a class it, then you take the, the second uh, sorry then you convert um, this character into a digit again it's it's simply a function that can do it or it may not because if character is like a it's not convertible so you also capture it in the uh, in the case class in the instance and then you repeat steps one and two and again this the fact that you want to repeat it is simply a value in practice it looks like this you don't obviously create in this uh, uh, members of the grammar class you simply use combinators that are provided and you supply them with functions so the functions he function here it looks complex but it actually just checks first character and returns you a string without that character and the character itself but this is business logic it's just how i would like to do it in my specific application then once you have the grammar once you have used these combinators, you simply supply it to library machinery. And you get, uh, as you can see from a signature, it's a function that you can execute. Now, this is your final result. But because you're working with not just functions, we're working with parsers, by combining the business logic and <coughs> Oops. 
Excuse me. Excuse me. <coughs> people are <coughs> people are not functions. <coughs> Sorry. People are not functions. And in functional programming, functions are sort of <coughs> bug free, but people are not. Bugs can easily crawl in. Sorry about the delay. Okay, so what you get as a result, you get all those use cases handled. <coughs> yeah, there is a problem with my voice. So get all those use cases handled. You can go from, let's say, an empty list, empty string into your result, and you can see that the result is achieved. The reminder is empty, and the result is no digits. And if, if you can go from, um, if you go back from something that is not a digit, <coughs> Try to fix it. <coughs> if you go from the result that may not, it is not a digit, you'll get um, a value with an error. So I was I promised you um, a real example, something that you can go from a rule engine program into its representation. How would you do it with a library? So first thing you do, it's it's actually very simple. First thing you do, you will create you instantiate a parsers module. It gives you uh, just an instance of all possible combinators and interpreters. That's our output. And by instantiating module, you also fix your input type. So then you have, <coughs> you define your output structure, could be this. Yeah, it's Scala, so wildcard imports uh, are somewhat crawling in. Um, you can also specify your types. Well, you have to, of course. But I simply be did synonyms. So I defined my grammar as a data structure that has no no state for now. We don't use it for this example. Uh, the error is string and the value is A. And once it's done, what I would like to show you is that building a parser program from combinators is extremely simple. You see, what is an expression in this case? According to our definition of data structure, it's value or a function. Yeah, um, where is pipe coming from? In most of the libraries that deal with parsers, pipe and the tilde, uh, these two operations represent pipe is Check a value if it doesn't work, check another pass. And the tilde is check a value and another value. But I know that some people has very strong stands over symbolic functions. So we have other combinators that are <coughs> normal normal string functions. You can even use one in the middle, but I really don't recommend it. But bad style. Um, now, what is a function, really? If you look at this text, a function is its, is its name, an open param, and then some arguments, and then close param. A name would be number of alpha characters. Arguments would be somewhat more exp um, somewhat more complicated. It's uh, an expression here. This is this one. Then maybe some more uh, separated by comma or non-expression, like in this rule B. There are no uh, arguments. 
the value I just did it as digits, so it's a digit repeated at least once. Otherwise, like what kind of value is it? And digit, uh, digit is <coughs> a character which you uh, checked that it's it's a character in the valid range with the filter function. And finally, a character is something you consume from a string. So you see, it's it's very intuitive, in fact. Describing how you go from this into some structured data like this, it's very intuitive. Of course, I didn't mention that you have to map them, but mm, mapping, mapping itself only looks difficult because we have this one nice tool, it's called IntelliJ. And IntelliJ highlights what kind of types you want to use. So your mapping function, if you, if you look at it closely, you have one or another, so which means your pattern match on the left and the right side, and the scala it's either. And then you simply check what's in there and then map it. What you would get is this value. Once you create an expression, you can create a parser by just giving it the expression. And if you run the parser, you will get the result. So this is something any algorithm can work with. You simply work with structured data now. You can migrate it. You can find all things like from DB and change them from my DB. It's so easy. You know where to look for them. It's not longer looking them in the text. It's looking them in the real structure that you can traverse. If you check that structure and go into a printer implementation, you'll get the text back. So you can change this from DB and it's gonna be different soon. And it's a valid program and you can save it back, migration applied. So that's that's the idea behind the things. But it's not all. What you can also do, you can take somewhat take care of those comments and confluence pages and what's not, which is always out of sync and um, you'll never find um, where my program is actually coming from. Who, 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 what is it doing? These comments are always out of sync. So you can tag your um, programs with, uh, yeah, depending on your style of programming. You can tag your mm, a little building blocks with some descriptions and use a different interpreter. In this case, it interprets into something called Bacchus now form. It's a well-known notation of uh, describing your programs. And uh, it's not a function, it's just a value. So if you run this interpreter, you get a description of this program, which, by the way, you can use this to, let's say, generate code in Java if you want. There are tools that can use this notation as input to generate more code or more programs. So like this is kind of export feature, if you may. <coughs> I didn't talk about state, so um, you can. What we used is the error channel. Uh, when we used, when we uh, uh, assessed that character is a digit, we used the filter function. It's like a normal filter you do in list. You supply a predicate and you check that your value uh, complies with certain boolean condition. So here you would, uh, if you run something that is, if you give a uh, input that is not correct, like compare one and dollar, where one is in dollar, you would get the left, uh, the result is the left, which is an error message. You can do the same, but with state. All combinators in the libraries that accept, uh, that work with error, can also work with state and error. And IntelliJ can even give you which ones, it's so easy to discover them. So this one uh, takes a function from a state to state and error. So that way you can, oh yeah, um, and when you consume characters, there are also stateful operations because you obviously need to initialize your state. So state in a library is always under user's control. Uh, so what you can do is, let's say, you want to list errors in specific position. Fine, you may 
want to return the position itself. Also, you can do it. It's really up to you. You can even build a debugger if, if it's what you need. You can um, find all steps while the parser or printer executes. You can just log your steps. And when you do that and you send some kind of state addition function, so you add this error to your list of errors, uh, the result will be for this program that on character 11 out of 12, you have these errors encountered. It really looks like a compiler error message, in fact. It tells you, at this position, I'm expecting something, but it wasn't there. So these are possible variations of what I would see if, I, if, if you would correct it. Now, this is the hard part because by doing something in the domain of parsing, I invaded the very well populated space. There are libraries, so this resource is called Awesome Scala. It lists <coughs> the resources in the Scala land. So at least four libraries here are parsers, combinators, libraries. And the two encircled are very well used and known. Now, I, I personally don't think that I compete with them in any way. But it's just my opinion. People will probably have their own. So what I did, I compiled a little table where I listed why I think we are not in competition and what features are really make distinction between these libraries. So first of all, my goal was <laughs> to build something that is invertible. So other libraries don't use it. It's not their goals. So that's the difference. And to me, it's enough, but because let's be objective. <laughs> I don't know how can I be objective promoting my own library, but let's pretend I am. Uh, I don't have any dependencies in my library. It's a uh, it doesn't pull anything. That's what the Z stands in parsers. It's zero dependency. Uh, in fast parse, so how we Lee uh, has dependency on source code, but it's also his own library. So it's kind of no dependency. Uh, and parboiled, that library, it, it depends on shapeless. So in shapeless, you know, if you, if you pull in shapeless dependency, you need to make sure that <coughs> all your uh, other dependencies on shapeless are in sync. So you, it's simply not really binary compatible. So, but everybody knows. Then the other thing I after is I need invertibility. Because I need invertibility, I cannot work with just strings and other libraries do. They are specialized on parsing text and in my case, I, don't, I cannot specialize in it. I need to go both ways. So I simply accept any type. And for performance, OK, so I'm not really optimized anything yet. Uh, I might, but it's really hard to optimize generalized thing. When you specialize on something, you can optimize. You, you, you have your optimization parameters. If you're completely generic, then what is your optimization parameter? It, it's simply hard to find one. So that's why I don't have any optimization. In those libraries, they optimize on the fact that they are parsing text. So they use a uh, macro, for example, to generate uh, code. But in my library, you cannot use it. The function is supplied by user. So if user supplies something that is completely suboptimal, well, library cannot be blamed for that. It's a tool. And what I mean by generality, um, what I mean is, how many choices the library made for you? Again, it's kind of corresponds to specialized to non-specialized. So out of fun, I took this example, the biggest one in my uh, presentation, and I tried to express it. It's a, the argument parsing feature, where you have expressions by separated by comma, uh, or maybe no, no expressions. Well, I tried to replicate it in other libraries. In fast parts, I somewhat succeeded, so you can do it this way. But you see, uh, 
the alternative is after the map. Why is this? It's because uh, combinator in my library checks the alternative combinator. It checks A and B, so it's two, part, two grammars that produces A and B, respectively. And outputs a grammar that produces A or B in either, so it's Scala either type. Uh, but here you cannot do it because then um, macro expansion would not work. So what what he did is when the types aligned, then you would produce the alternative implementation because then you don't need to return either anymore. And in parboiled, so I frankly cheated, so that wouldn't compile. <laughs> Sorry, <coughs> but. Um, it wouldn't compile because of the shapeless, I think. Now, I don't know exactly, but I think that's the problem. Uh, what I'm saying here, and, uh, yeah, shapeless is because you see the return type is from the shapeless library. It's no longer just Scala. So they do things differently. What I'm trying to convey is that they do things differently, and I cannot, because I'm generic. That's why generality here is different. Another way to look at it is how the API footprint looks like. So in my library API, um, the tilde operator checks one grammar and the other one. So this is where B type comes from and A comes from whatever you call this on. And then the return result would be grammar of A and B, which is quite logical, but that's it. I don't have anything else. And I cannot check anything else because then I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but other libraries are optimized, and let's say fast parse checks uh, this thing. This thing is for tracing, um, understanding on the global level what is the word uh, white space and how you how you parse white spaces across your text input. Uh, in parboiled, it's way more complicated, and the author of uh, fast parse, uh, Harvey Lee, has actually says, I built my library because this one is so complicated I couldn't use it for my projects. Um, I may have agreed with him. Uh, however, it's uh, it's also like, it, it's a working solution. It's really cool library and just a kind of complicated. I have three checks away for you. Uh, number one, Scala is an awesome language. Can do really awesome thing with it. Um, complex problems don't necessarily require a complex solution. And the last one, if you ever need to do something like parsing and printing together, then there is a tool that can do both of things easily. It's called parsers. Thank you very much. <laughs> We do have time for questions, I think. Uh, please. Uh, I recently had to switch from uh, fast parse to atto just because I needed uh, incremental parsing. Is it something that affects your library or? Okay. Um, um, how does it? Compare? Yeah, uh, so the question, okay. <clears throat> so all parser libraries um, and then I showed the link. I'll probably just do it here again. So, Atto is here. And it says incremental text parsing. But all libraries are incremental parsing. They essentially do the same approach. It's the uh, deep dive. Some, I frankly don't remember how it's called in, in literature. But they do incremental parsing. And uh, my library also does incremental parsing. Uh, and if you see here, so the in my case the problem was that once you pass a string into a parser, you get some result, yes. and then you want to add more strings and the, uh, combine those strings with a result and produce a new result. So you, so you somehow have partial results. Uh -huh. So you cannot rely that. Uh, you get all the input up front, but you get some input, produce a result, then add input to this and produce new result. Okay, so in this case, it's not exactly incremental. Uh, what you're looking for is probably in monadic nature. And Atto is built on on cats. Uh, Atto parser is a monad. So we use this word, congratulations. <laughs> 
uh, yes, uh, in my case, it will affect my library because it would not be possible and simply because my parser isn't a monad. But this question was asked by John the Goes uh, last time I presented it. And I have an idea how to do it. So it will be definitely done. Because it's a very cool feature and I need it for my projects as well. I use this at work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No? Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, can you give give us some kind of idea of how the uh, what the trick is to the invertibility? I, I would I would uh, guess that each combinator in the um, in the parsers module. Uh, uh, has some is interpreted one way or the other uh, to run the parser or the printer. It, is there an example you could show or describe uh, succinctly how the interpreter is done? Both interpreters. So the trick that triggers invertibility. So um, there is no really a trick. What you have is you have. Um, where can I show it? You have parser, it's a function, right? So all you do is you create this parser and it accepts this input. And the printer, uh, thank you very much. So it simply combines those little building blocks. Does that answer your question? But uh, yeah, if you have some specifics, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you after the presentation. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I will repeat the question. Yes. Uh, okay, so the question was, you parse your source code and it has comments. And when you parse, you omit your comments and so they no longer in the output and how it can be invertible. Uh, it cannot, you're right, because what you did, you lost the data. And that's why you can, form you can perform optimizations in compilers that don't care about the data. But in this library, it's up to you. So you may choose to add your comments somewhere here. It's going to be a va another value that is a comment. And when you run this uh, program source code, you don't don't run those in the next stage. This is it. And then you can go back and it's invertible. Yes. Yes, I have a short question. So thanks for your presentation. I, uh, I, I had to, uh, one day I stumbled upon a problem where when I saw a very optimized uh, piece of code and um, it was extremely difficult then to put it uh, in a more generic uh, parser and and have you think thought if you we can inject some like, more uh, optimized code in uh, in your library um okay so library code probably cannot be as easily changed all of because it's source code you can download and change it the way you like but if you would phrase it as inject something, I don't think it's possible unless it's your function. Your mapping function may be as optimized as, as you as you want it to be. But that's probably the best answer I can give you. Because if, if you're trying to combine this things with some other parsing code, it's sort of restricted. However, there is one thing that I'm thinking about, and it's a way to piggyback on other optimized programs. Essentially, you would have your AST produced by uh, this library, and it then will be invertible. But when you execute it, you may you may try to do it with the other library. So it's kind of cheating because I would probably use an optimized parser as one of the arrows. Then the other arrow, I, I don't really know how to do it, but that's the idea I have. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you Questions? No more questions. 
Okay, then we can finish. Thank you very much.